Welcome to Evangel Church Online, a safe place for everyone to explore faith in Jesus. And today, we're gonna to discover that Jesus shines brightest in the darkness. So here we go. church one of our values is you were made for community welcome home and that just means that we are all a family here and we just want to give an opportunity to be family right where you are and in that chat mm -hmm. and so right now we want to invite you to pray for one another and it's going to be super simple in your own home and how you are going to invite people to pray for you is just by sharing your own need right there in the chat box so a few ground rules to this, because this is a public forum, we're asking you just to write if there's something that you would like covered in prayer in your life. Uh, don't write for other people. Uh, they can do that or you can reach out and pray for them on your own. But this is for your life. Uh, you know you have permission to share. Um, and so, yeah, if this is just be a great way. And then at the end of this, um, we just hope that our, us as a staff, we are going to just be praying through all the comments. Um, and maybe just preface with like a PR, prayer request. Yeah. And we will be going through this at the close of this time together. And hopefully you'll join us too as community, uh, loving one another, praying for one another. And if there is something that you want prayer for, but maybe don't want it in that chat, just head over to myevangel.church forward slash prayer and our team will be praying for that request uh, separate from that chat. Let's pass it now to Pastor Marcus. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Marcus, and I'm one of the pastors here at Evangel, and I'm so glad that you're here with us as we conclude our Eyes Wide Open series. Well, this past year was one that was certainly for the books. As we reflect on it, uh, it can be easy to look back and to kind of view the whole year as, as darkness, as one that we would like to forget, as, as 2020, the year that maybe we just don't need to remember. Well, we're, like I said, in our last week of our series called Eyes Wide Open. And I know it's been a great series for me to kind of shift my perspective that is, so that it's firmly set on Jesus and the hope that he is for each of us today. As I've personally shifted my perspective a little bit over this season and over the series, I want to read to you actually something from my journal. I wrote it on March 21st, 2020, so last year. It was only a short time after we entered into quarantine as we declared a state of emergency in BC. And so I wanna read just a small part of it today. It says the church, like capital C, the whole church, is waking up and it's immobilizing in unprecedented ways. Communities are banding together. People are learning again the value of home and family and we've been forced to slow down. Now, like I said, I wrote that early into the pandemic. I didn't realize that this was gonna be something that was lasting for more than just a couple of months, that now we're almost at a full year of being uh, in, the, in, in this pandemic here, at least in BC. And so was what I said a bit naive to the reality of what this year was gonna be? Well, maybe, but as I thought about it and as I was reading this over again, just as I was reflecting in my journal, I had a different thought. I thought maybe actually this wasn't naive at all. Maybe this response, maybe this view of what was going on in the world was actually one that was hopeful. Now, don't hear me wrong. I don't want to minimize the pain that has happened in this season, that there has been profound loss, that there has been profound pain, there's pro been profound hardship, and there has been just a, an overwhelming sense of challenge in this COVID season. By no means am I trying to minimize that or um, even ignore that today. But when our eyes are set on Jesus, how does our hope in him exist at the same time as this pain, as this hardship, as this loss? It seems almost irreconcilable for both of them to exist within us at the same time. They're so, they feel so opposing to each other. Wouldn't it just be nice if our hope in Jesus just short-circuited our brains and our emotions so that we had a selective amnesia as to what was going on around us that was painful or negative or challenging? Well, maybe it would be easier. Maybe it would be easier 
to have all of that pain and loss and hardship, the memory of it, the pain of it that we're feeling in our emotions removed. But I think actually in, if we did that, it would remove a sense of what it means to be human. And at the same time, I think it would actually minimize the power of hope in Jesus. So by no means am I hoping that we experience these hardships, but what I do think is that the power of our hope in Jesus is shown the clearest in times where the world is darkest. Because the miracle of hope in Jesus is that it means in every circumstance that we go through, there is purpose for us. And there is also purpose for the mission that we're on together today. So I wanna look at a story in scripture that, that almost parallels some of the way that the world is right now and how our response of hope can actually be powerful in our lives and in the lives of others. So today we're gonna to turn to Acts chapter 16, verse 25 to 34. If you don't have a Bible and you're joining us on this stream today, uh, we really love to resource people with God's word here at Evangel. So if you don't have like a physical Bible in, that you can hold in your hands, or if you don't even have like a digital Bible, if you go to myevangel.church forward slash Bible, there's a form that you can fill out so that we can like give you a physical copy, or if you're wanting to just stay digital, uh, there is also some steps on how to download a digital one on your phone or on your tablet. And so we would love to just resource you in that way. And so if you don't have that, feel free to head there. But we're gonna read that together and then we're gonna pray. Acts chapter 16, verse 25 to 34. It says, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all of the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, do not harm yourself for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all of his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. Let's pray together. God, we thank you that you are our living hope, that we can place it in you and that it's secure, that it's enduring, uh, and that we can experience it for us today. God, I pray that if we are feeling like we are stuck in a prison cell moment, if our eyes seem very dim to what is going around, on around us or even to you, God, may you open our eyes anew and afresh this morning. We thank you and we pray this in your name, amen. Well, this story here that we just read, it's kind of a snapshot of a greater story going on on either side of chapter 16 of Acts. Well, Paul and Silas find themselves thrown in jail because of a wrongful conviction. If you read back a bit in this chapter, you see that Paul and Silas were walking through the city of Philippi and they found this enslaved girl. And she actually had a, a spirit of oppression or a demonic spirit within her that allowed her to divine the future of those around her. But she was a slave and so her owners were using her as a tool to make money. Where basically people would come to her, she would divine part of their future and they would pay them. Well, Paul and Silas saw what that situation was, saw the oppression of, of a spirit, of an evil spirit that this girl was experiencing. And so in the name of Jesus, they called that out of her. And as a result, she was no longer able to divine people's futures. And so the owners, uh, receiving lots of income from that girl, were obviously very upset that Paul and Silas had done this. And so what he does is he goes to the courts and he incites that they were converting people to an, an illegal religion. And so as the courts hear this story, this wrongful, con this wrongful accusation, they actually throw Paul and Silas in jail for what they did. And, but they weren't just put into any old jail cell. If you look at history and if you look at Roman um, prisons at that time, they were, they were broken up into kind of three compartments. The first one was called the communiora, where there was light and fresh air, it was low security, people could move about. It was kind of like a lush prison, so to speak. 
The next one was called the Interiora. It had strong iron bars, it had locks on the doors, it was a little bit more secure. And then finally, there was the Telanium, which was the deepest dungeon. In this part of the jail, there was no light, there was no fresh air, and people were placed there simply to die. Not only were they locked in in their rooms, but they were also shackled to the wall in bonds. But the way that it was done uh, was done in strange angles so that they were in like constant agonizing pain as these shackles were around their legs. And yet Paul and Silas, in this weird wrongful accusation, were not just thrown in the nice part of the prison, but they were thrown in the Telanium. They were guarded 24 seven by a soldier. And yet, Scripture records that amongst all of this crazy circumstance, out of all of this crazy moment, in this horrible dungeon that they were in, that they were praying and singing hymns to God. Could you imagine for a moment yourself in that, that jail cell as another prisoner? That you're there, it's dark, you can't see a single thing, you know that the end of your life is coming soon, and yet you hear uh, this praying and this singing going on around you from another cell. Because I can imagine that area of the jail was usually full of groaning. It was usually full of the sounds of the shackles around their legs clinking and clacking in an ominous way. It was full of the sounds of people dying and also the silence that happened as a result of their death. And so in the midst of this, it's no wonder that scripture records very, I think importantly, that the prisoners were listening to the singing and to the, to the praying that Paul and Silas were doing. I think they were listening so intently because it was so unbelievably opposite to what usually would be uh, heard in these jail cells. It was, this expression of hope was so profoundly opposite of what was happening to these people, Paul and Silas included. Because the reality is Paul and Silas were still in bonds. They would still be in horrible pain. They would be expecting for themselves to die in there. But their eyes were wide open to the hope found in Jesus and it evoked a response from them. Because they could have easily chosen to have their eyes focus on the shackles around them, the enduring pain in their body, the death that they were likely headed toward. But instead, Instead, they chose to remain focused on Jesus, and it naturally caused others to listen to what they were doing and saying. Have you ever felt a bit like Paul and Silas in this story? Although we are not in an ancient Roman jail, we have in this season been confined to our homes where some of our rights have been uh, temporarily put on pause so that we can ensure the safety and well-being of those around us, that there are people who are sick and dying around us. There are people who are very quickly losing their fleeting hope. And if you're a believer today, you haven't been insulated from this either. And if I'm being honest, this past year for me has been one that was really, really difficult. And the biggest difficulty I think came through my mental health. There were moments last year and, and many of them where I felt a prisoner to my own mind, where I felt like in my mind and in my emotions, I was uh, in a place of darkness as well. I was simply in a survival mode for much of 2020. And as I was praying into and studying uh, for this sermon, I was so convicted that there were so many moments last year where I missed out on choosing hope in spite of my circumstances. And yet what I know now and what I knew then is that hope was never far away. But it was me who was distant. It was me who missed out on choosing hope in my circumstances. It was me who forgot that I need to embrace this gift of hope in Jesus. Because when we are faced with our own prison cell moments, we too have a choice. Will we be people who are heard praying and singing because of the overflow of our hope in Jesus? Or will our voices be indistinguishable from all the others? Because our hope isn't tied to our circumstances. Our hope isn't tied to our pain or lack thereof. Our hope isn't tied to the pieces of our life that we maybe feel we hold in our hands right now. Like Pastor Lucas said last week, the difference between hope and hopelessness is our perspective. Because hope is a miracle given by Jesus, but to be experienced, we have to choose it for ourselves. I wanna remind you today, 
It's a simple truth, but one that sometimes can be easy to forget. That Jesus is not far from you today. He is with you right now. No matter how dark it feels for you today or in this past season, he is there in your prison cell moments. And I pray that our eyes are open to him today. As I was reflecting on Paul and Silas praying and singing these hymns, I was kind of reminded of something that, our, that the counseling program director at my college that I attended said about the power of singing and the benefit that it brings. And so I wanted to do a little bit of additional digging. And as I did on this idea of the benefits of singing, I think it's so interesting that I got to see how God works in the way that he created us. Because there's actually been extensive study on the benefits of singing. Uh, for instance, I learned that singing actually raises our endorphins, which is like the feel good or pleasure center of our brain. It releases oxytocin, which is a chemical that enhances feelings of safety, of trust, and of bonding. And singing also lowers our cortisol, which is the stress hormone that we find in our brain. Singing has been shown to reduce depression and loneliness. And according to Time Magazine, a recent study even attempts to make the case that music evolved as a tool of social living. And that the pleasure that comes from singing together is actually a reward for coming together cooperatively rather than inside in, of hiding alone with kind of an every person for him or herself mentality. Well, if Paul and Silas's hope-filled expression was that impactful on their physical bodies, I can imagine that it would be just as impactful on their spiritual sense as well. I can only imagine that as Paul and Silas were sitting there in that jail cell in the dark, feeling isolated and alone, feeling fearful for their lives, feeling stressed out and frustrated that they were wrongfully conv convicted. And yet they were singing. They were singing. They were allowing the pleasure center in their brain to be activated where pain decreases in that moment, where their singing maybe actually bonded them closer to Jesus. It allowed their trust to increase in him, where their singing actually decreased the stress that they were feeling in this situation where their singing was bringing people together even in their prison cell as all of the other prisoners were listening. If that's, all that it, if that's the incredible benefit that it did for their physical bodies, I wonder what it was doing for them spiritually. Where spiritually was it bonding them closer to Jesus? Spiritually was it encouraging their heart to be able to remain hopeful even in this crazy circumstance? It's amazing that a hope-filled response uh, is something that God gives us that affects our physical bodies, but also affects our spirits as well. Because the power of our hope in Jesus is shown the clearest in times where the world seems the darkest. Paul was no stranger to challenging circumstances. He was stoned twice. He was eventually martyred for his faith. He was uh, thrown into a shipwreck. He was like, they poured boiling oil on him. Like he lived a very tumultuous life. And yet he wrote a, a bit of a reflection in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 to 18. It says, But we have this treasure, meaning our hope in Jesus, in jars of clay, to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. We were struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in, body, in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke, we also believe. And so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. The scripture is a well-known one. 
But today, can we approach it with a little bit of a set of fresh eyes, with a fresh heart and a fresh spirit? Can you reflect on the season that you've been, not just in 2020, but just over your life, and realize that yes, you may have been afflicted, but you were not crushed. You may have been perplexed, overwhelmed with trying to wrap your head around why and what and how all of this pandemic was happening, but you were not driven to despair, that you were not forsaken, that Jesus is and always will be with you, that you may have been struck down, but you were not destroyed. This is reason to celebrate. It is a reason to have hope that if God brought you through all that he has over your life, over 2020, that he will continue to carry you in this season too, whatever it may bring. That our hope is in Jesus and the promise of eternity with him, free from the bonds of sin, free from sickness, free from the oppression of sin, and restored to right relationship with God. That is why our hope is enduring, because its source is a person who is eternal, who is loving, who is good to us, who is constant and who is trustworthy of what he says. And as we read this passage, or as I just read that passage in Corinthians, I wanna highlight one verse, just as we reflect. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. Like I said, Jesus brings meaning and purpose and hope to our pain. Our hope in prison cell moments that we experience can actually lead others to Jesus in the process. Because we see in this story, when a violent earthquake causes the prison cells to bust open, the shackles blow off their legs, and the prisoners are able to escape if they were able, if they wanted to. Well, this might go down as kind of the weirdest attempted prison break yet. Um, it wasn't even attempted, it just happened. It was quite the act of God. But it actually wasn't a prison break at all. When we look at scripture, it says, when the jailer woke up and saw the doors of the prison were open, he drew his sword and was going to kill himself since he, thought, since he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul called out in a loud voice, do not harm yourself because we are all still here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas and said, sirs, and brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? After this, or at this earthquake, Paul and Silas could have seen this as kind of their immediate deliverance, where finally God was moving and he broke them literally out of their prison. After all, they were wrongfully accused. Wouldn't this have been the best repayment that they could have experienced? And when they saw the jailers, they were fleeing from that prison cell. The person ensuring their captivity, they could have said, well, he was part of a wrongful conviction. He was a Roman soldier against Christianity. He wasn't upholding the law with integrity. But here's the thing, a perspective of hope that comes from knowing Jesus compels us to hope for others too, even, when, even those who we would consider as part of the problem, even those people that we would consider are maybe beyond the realm of God's forgiveness. I wanna say this gently, but in this season, I've seen so many people, including us as believers, and especially maybe us as believers, placing their hope in things that are broken because our hope will never be sustained if we place it in political parties. Our hope will never be put, uh, sustained if we place it in our law and justice system, in our health system, for me and the control that I hope to have over knowing what life brings. This is because these things are fleeting. They're broken. They're in need of redeeming. But we place our hope in Jesus and in his kingdom, not the ones that we see around us here. Do we still fight for these things? Yes. Do we still advocate for the best in all the things that I just mentioned? Of course. But if our hope is in those things, it will only be fleeting and it will fail when we face those prison cell moments. But there is a better way. There is a better way. Psalm 27, 20 verse seven says, some trust or put their hope in chariots and some in horses but we trust in the name of the Lord, our God. Can I gently suggest that some of us maybe need to shift our hope back to Jesus and have that renew our perspective, our minds and our mission? Because here's the thing, a hope-filled response, no matter what it is or who it's in, will produce a response from us. 
And yet if we're placing those hope as believers in things that are broken or fleeting or transient, then the expression that we have will also be broken. It will also be fleeting. It will also be one that doesn't sustain ourselves or those around us. But if we place our hope and if we place our trust in the Lord our God, then our response is one that reveals not us, not a political party, not a group of people, not a health system or a law justice system that we feel is correct, but it reveals Jesus, our Savior. It reveals Jesus, one who died for us. It reveals Jesus, the one who is our living hope. Because the power of our hope in Jesus is the clearest when the world seems the darkest. And in the story that we read in Acts, the tables had truly turned. The prisoners were no longer at their darkest hour, but the, the jailer sure was. This is because in Roman law, if prisoners, were, if prisoners had escaped from, from their cells, then the person who was responsible for jailing them or watching over them would have to repay life for life, which is why the jailer in that moment immediately drew his sword and was ready to kill himself. But our hope in Jesus causes us to hope for others in their darkest hours, too. Paul and Silas didn't even give it a thought. It was almost second nature to them. They knew the laws, but they decided to act mercifully, declaring that all the prisoners were present and accounted for, that they were those who took the hope that they had and shared it with this jailer. And so what does this hope in the jailer that Paul and Silas held do for him? Well, it actually led him to ask, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Your pain has purpose for yourself, but it can also have purpose and meaning for those around you as well. Can we be people whose eyes are wide open to sharing the hope that we have in Jesus with other people? It doesn't require you today to know all of the answers, to have it all together, to be able to theologically place together exactly what you need to say, but simply to have eyes to see the opportunity that Jesus places in front of us. Well, when we look at this story, it can be inspiring to see the hope-filled responses of Paul and Silas, even amidst their challenging situation. But it kind of begs the question, how do we as believers foster that hope in Jesus? How does it become such second nature like it was for Paul and Silas? How does it become something that's a bold expression of who Jesus is? How do we have our hope in Jesus be an authentic response in times of challenge where it's not forced like, oh, well, this is happening, but I have hope. Oh, well, this is happening, but it's okay. Like, how do we have that be authentic in our lives? Well, I could probably offer a bunch of tips and tricks and five ways to ex like share your hope with Jesus uh, in Jesus with people. But I actually instead just want to offer God's word to you today. And this is something that's uh, kind of close to my heart right now. As I was kind of reflecting over what I wanted uh, in 2021, as I was reflecting where God was calling me in 2021, it was clear that uh, the verse that I'm going to share for you is actually my theme verse for this year. It comes from John chapter 15 verse 4 to 5. And it says, Remain in me, and I in you. Just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine, this is Jesus, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit, because you can do nothing without me. I said earlier that there were moments where I wasn't great at choosing hope last year, even though it wasn't far from me. Well, this year, I think I'm encouraged to remain in him, that our hope in him is an expression of simply our ability to remain in him. I pray for you this year that as you remain in Jesus, even in spite of our circumstances, that he will reveal himself to you in greater ways, that he will be close to you and that you will be close to him. Because we can have an authentic response of hope in Jesus even in spite of our circumstances, by simply remaining in him, by remaining in his word, by remaining in prayer and conversation with him, by remaining in a reliance on him to do it so that we don't try to do it on our own strength. I pray that this remaining allows our eyes to be opened every day, new and fresh to the hope that Jesus is, to the hope that he is always near to us, and that he can be shown to those around us. 
If today you're feeling like you're maybe in a prison cell moment, but haven't ever known the hope of Jesus, can I encourage you that there is a God who knows you, who loves you, and who will be with you in every circumstance. He knows everything about you, even the parts that you maybe want to remain hidden, and yet he still chooses you. He still loves you. He still sent his son to die for you, to restore that relationship with him so that we can be close to him. You can experience hope even in the darkest of circumstances. And so will you respond today, like the jailer, by asking the simple yet most important question that you can ask of what must I do to be saved? And the answer, because I'm not gonna make you find that, the answer is, and scripture says, we read it in our story, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. It doesn't require any perfection. Again, it doesn't require for you to have your life together, but simply your willingness to believe in Jesus and have his hope fill your entire life. So that prison cell moment cannot be one that is the end, but one that renews your hope and, sustain, and, and that your hope in him is sustained even through it. So I wanna pray for us today. God, thank you so much that no matter where we find ourselves today, that you are still our hope. God, I pray simply that we would remain in you. And as we remain in you, that you produce great things within us, that you produce and, and increase and fill our lives with hope. And that that hope would overflow, that people would listen and that people would ask that question, that it would be contagious and that it would be something that is just a simple expression of remaining in your word, of remaining in relationship with you, in remaining with the one who is our hope. God, we thank you so much that no matter what prison cell we may find ourselves in, that you are with us, that you love us, that this isn't the end, but that we can experience eternity with you. And so God, we thank you. We love you and we pray this in your name. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us, friends. We'll see you next week. Well, thank you, Marcus. And I, I hope that you guys are encouraged. Indeed, Jesus does shine brightest in the darkness. And we're just so excited to see all that he's doing, even uh, when circumstances don't look fantastic around us. And God is always at work, so there's always hope. So thank you. Uh, we just wanted to pivot a little bit and let you know that our library is open for you to collect some reading during this COVID season. We have some dreams and aspirations for that space, but before we can do that, we need to get as many of these books uh, out of here as possible. And so we hope that we can be a blessing to you. If you're growing in faith and wanna study the word, there's resources in there for that. There, if you want just to, to go into some fictional world, uh, there's uh, fiction books in there as well, and just a lot of great stuff. So we hope that that can help resource you. Come anytime, you can come today, uh, between nine and noon, we'll be here till noon. And you can come during the week and come say hi, and then hit the library, check it out, and take some books home to add to your library. Yeah, uh, January 31st will be the last day to do that. And after the 31st, we will be looking for an organization that would benefit from having all of those books. So make sure you come this week. Well, we wanted to say thank you so much for your faithfulness and your generosity. As you know, mm -hmm. we believe in generosity here at Evangel. We believe that it makes room in our heart for others. And we are a church of first fruits. We believe that God has called us as believers to sow back into what he's doing in our communities. So would you partner with us um, through your giving at myevangel.church forward slash give? Or again, you can come in. Today we have drive through generosity. We're here until noon and we're here in the week. But we also wanted to let you know, part of what your um, giving and your generosity goes towards is our global partners. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to say a huge thank you that you not only blessed Powell River this past year, but you were able to bless Spain and Romania and the Canadian government and restricted access nations. You were able to be an encouragement to people who are bringing the hope and the love of Jesus to people who need to hear it all around the world. So thank you so much for your faithfulness. 
We just have one more thing before we go, and that is we are moving to 9 a.m. as of February 7th, which is the first Sunday in February. So make sure you mark that on your calendar, because if you come at 10, we're, we're anticipating we're an increase in people watching in their pajamas. We feel like that ratio is gonna go up moving to nine, and we feel like that'll be a good That kind of makes me spot. sad because we won't be able to be spot. in our jam pajamas either. Maybe we'll kick it off that Sunday <laughs> in our pajamas. So if you wanna see, uh, I have Disney pajamas, so <laughs> we will not be here in our pajamas. Anyway, we are so, <laughs> we're so glad that you were joining us here at church today, friends. We hope to see you face-to-face -face really soon. Have a great week. God bless.